This is Mike Rother. We sometimes do a live demonstration of the 50-minute caught on the classroom exercise for teachers. This short video is an introduction that was presented at one of those demonstrations. Please share this video with as many teachers as you can and encourage them to try the caught on the classroom exercise for scientific thinking in their classrooms. The purpose of this session is to give you first-hand experience with a classroom exercise that helps teach the meta skill of scientific thinking. Meta be, meaning you can apply it to anything. And I have children, and the more you think about it, what can we teach our children? Uh, we can give them knowledge, and there's knowledge that we need to know and that we need to teach, of course. But we don't know what the kids, the students, our children, young people, we don't know what they're going to be facing 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. We have no way of knowing that. How do we prepare them for that? And maybe one of the best ways we can equip them for dealing with those situations that they'll face is a practical, scientific way of achieving difficult objectives, a practical, scientific way of dealing with obstacles, a practical, scientific way of meeting difficult challenges. Uh, and that's what I mean by a meta skill. And again, I don't mean to supplant teaching of information with that, but rather to complement teaching of information with, hey, here's a skill. So on the one hand, wow, we have this great practical pattern of, um, uh, of scientific thinking called the improvement kata. That's simply the name we gave it. And it's very similar to other scientific patterns. Uh, and we've also learned that in order to pick up new skills, new ways of thinking, you really do have to practice. So basically what we're doing is combining those two things. A, a practical scientific pattern with some routines of deliberate practice. Okay, uh, the first thing I wanted to say was uh, they are a free, all the materials that we use in the exercise that we're going to do in a few minutes are available online as a free download. Uh, the website is katadegrow.com. Uh, feel free to go there. All this stuff is there. Uh, okay, let's begin with scientific thinking a little bit. How many times have you looked at something, like you're looking at a stove you're cooking on or whatever, uh, you, you, you're focusing on something and you see something out of the corner of your eye and you say, there's the cat sitting on a chair, right? And then when you turn and look at that, it turns out to be a jacket on the chair or something else. It's not the cat. A common experience. We all have that experience. And so I see something, think it's something, turn your head, it's different. It's not what you thought. What's interesting about that to me is that our brain did not say, there's something over there, could be the cat, might not be, I'm not sure, get more information, hold tight, don't know. You know. Instead, the brain fills in the blanks automatically without us knowing it, does it instantly, uh, and, and we're pretty darn sure that it's the cat, right? Uh, so it's interesting to me that the brain doesn't alert us to the fact that it's doing that, right? Now, don't get me wrong. I think it's a very important cognitive mechanism for humans to get through life, uh, which I'm trying to depict with this guy riding his bike there. Imagine if you had to consciously decide everything, you know, in traffic, uh, driving, walking, in conversation, if you weren't able to just judge quickly, subconsciously, and, and shift and adjust, you'd never make it through the day. So this mechanism of overshooting our knowledge threshold and filling in the blanks, some people say with sawdust, but it's, a, it's an educated guess that our mind puts in there, right, based on past experience. If we didn't have that mechanism, we'd be in trouble. We probably wouldn't be here today. The thing is, though, it does cause some problems. We often don't notice the knowledge threshold. We don't even see it because our brain fills in the blanks. We, f we feel very certain, and then we make faulty decisions. We operate on them. And it's very difficult for adults to say, I don't know. So a countermeasure to that mechanism, uh, cognitive mechanism that we all have is scientific thinking. I, I think this is a great definition of scientific thinking that I've run into a couple of times. A routine of intentional coordination between what we think will happen, kind of a theory, what actually happens, and adjusting based on what we learn from the difference. And I think this diagram here shows it pretty nicely. It's about as simple as you can get. But we teach science as if it's something for scientists. You're going to have to have a lab coat if you're going to be able to do this, and I don't think that's true at all. I think what we're looking at here is a life skill that's important for everyone, 
And, and when scientific thinking or the scientific method become complicated or they're presented in complicated ways, it just raises that hurdle up for, well, I'm not going to be a scientist. I, I can't do that. Whereas, in fact, it's really quite simple. And honestly, I don't, I don't think we're going to move forward, really, in our organizations and so forth and with many of the challenges we face until we make scientific thinking more of a life skill for everyone. And one way to do that is with a make it simple, make a 50-minute exercise that we're going to do here that anyone can do. So scientific thinking, is it something we're born with or is it something you learn? And we are clearly not born with scientific thinking because of that very cognitive mechanism I talked about. The fact that our brain automatically fills in the blanks without us knowing about it makes us poor out of the gate at scientific thinking. So it is something we learn through practice, almost by definition. So what is Cog the Classroom? It's an exercise that introduces, and I'll tell you in a moment while I underline that word, it's an exercise that introduces a practical pattern of scientific thinking in an engaging way that easily fits within a teacher's existing instructional plan. It's a 50-minute activity uh, with three-minute rounds. It involves student teams working on a number of self-generated iterations to complete a small puzzle. That's what you'll do here today. The student teams follow the improvement Cata pattern to establish a goal and then experiment toward it from round to round. Uh, improvement kata pattern, we'll go through it so I don't need to dwell on it. Uh, it's a four-step scientific pattern of thinking and working that's a practice routine in business organizations. Essentially, it means you experiment your way forward instead of trying to decide your way forward. Number first step is what's the overall direction or challenge we're trying to get to? What's the big goal that's out there, the, the, the goal that might scare us a little bit? Number two, you got to know where you are. We don't want people picking action items and steps and goals out of thin air. We say, well, first you got to understand where you are relative to that distant challenge, then you set your next target condition on the way, and then you can begin a series of experiments. So one teaching challenge we have with with these kinds of exercises are if you do an experiential exercise, a a simulation game I'm calling it here, that becomes very diverting and if we don't watch out, the students simply, yeah, what'd you do today? I built a tower out of spaghetti to support a marshmallow, or I built this puzzle in this little kata exercise. But of course, That's fine, but what we also want them to get is the way of working. So there are a number of things in this exercise. You'll see graphics and simple tools to try to keep the students aware of the pattern that they're practicing, not just the fun game that they're playing. And that's an ongoing challenge. I I wouldn't say we've licked that problem, but we are aware of that issue. Uh, There's a PowerPoint file at this point that walks you through the exercise. It it will facilitate it with you. It's step by step, and there are are prompts at the bottom of each, underneath the slide, if you put it in the presenter view. uh, Takes you through each step. The materials can be used as they are, but the downloadable materials are not PDF, they're PowerPoint and Word format so that you can change them. Perhaps you use a different lingo in your classroom. And so you can adjust the materials to suit your particular needs. What we like to say is run it once as designed, then you've kind of got it, and then you can, exactly, then you can experiment with it. The reason I say this exercise simply introduces the way of thinking is that if the teacher finds favor with this pattern, then they'll use it again. They'll leave the poster up on the wall and maybe say, hey, why could we could do it like that? We could approach it this way. And that's where the students start to get the repetitive practice, which is what we're doing in business organizations where we have coaching cycles every day for like 10 or 15 minutes where the coach says, you know, what's your target condition? Where are you now? What was your last experiment? What did you learn? Okay, what's that leading you to try next on the way to a goal, right? And it's through that repetition that eventually the pattern gets in there and the coach, can, the coach which would be the teacher in this case, uh, can make course corrections that we get it to the point where the student will later in life go, you know what, we're all talking about our opinions here. That's not really a good way to meet a challenge. Why don't we set this up as a bit of an experiment trajectory towards something we want to achieve? That's what we're trying to get to. All right, uh, why don't we just try it?